Hey everyone, uh, so here we are in our last topic on uh, evolution. And so uh, this topic is about macro evolution. And up at the top, we can see this word speciation. So I hope when you look at that word and you think of the concept of new species. So I'm not sure the number of different species we have on our planet, but I know it ranges in the millions, if not uh, tens of millions, right? Tens of millions, whoops, tens of millions of different species on our planet today. Tens of millions of different species existing on our planet. And so last class on Friday, we were looking at microevolution. And so just to flash back, and actually I can remember as I started reading ahead here, I could remember what we were talking about, where I missed a fill in the blank. But when we were talking about microevolution, okay, we're talking about small changes. We could scroll down to this piece right here. I think this is the part where I missed a fill in the blank, right? Um, from above, we can say that if allele frequencies change within populations from generation to generation, then evolution is occurring, right? Specifically, we would say microevolution. Because they're small changes from one generation to the next, okay? But it's still evolution. It's key. Because those small changes where we're going with here, these small changes add up significantly over time and lead us into macroevolution, all right? So macro or microevolution versus macroevolution. Microevolution occurs over relatively small periods of time, generation to generation within the population of a species. All right, macroevolution occurs over geological time. Remember back to our time scale here when we were looking at the start of this all and breaking down our billions and billions of years into eons and eras, right? Well, this is what we refer to as geological time. Hundreds, if not billions of years, right? So macroevolution occurs over geological time, what we would refer to as millennia, thousands of years, millions of years. And of specific interest in macroevolution is the development of a new species, or what is referred to as speciation. Okay, we talked about this briefly on Friday with respect to what defines a population and that populations uh, are groups of the same species that live and exist within an area and the key being that they interbreed. So two species that cannot interbreed are considered a different species. An obvious example would be a bear and a deer, right? They're separate species. They do not interbreed. But what about two different species of frogs, right? When we look at one frog to another and yeah, maybe there might be very subtle differences, and in some cases, there might be very drastic differences, but they look like frogs, right? A frog is a frog, green slimy skin, right? Web feet. Um, but in fact, there's many different species of frogs. And, and in fact, I think there's over 5,000 different species of frogs, um, right? Uh, at some point in time, Darwin would say that they had a common ancestor. Right? So if we think back, one of Darwin's ideas is descent with modification from a common ancestor. So when we think about all these frogs that exist on our planet, from bullfrogs to tree frogs to poison dart frogs, right? Um, we, we've got different species that do not interbreed. So the question becomes at what point and how did each diverge from that common ancestor? 
And this is what macro evolution looks at. So regardless of when, the what was due to some what we call isolating mechanism. And we were talking about this briefly on Friday, right? Isolate, we think of the founder effect, right? Remember that? Or those examples like the bottleneck and the founder effect of, of essentially um, sort of isolating an individual group, right? So these are what are called isolating mechanisms. Something in the past that caused the original ancestral population of frogs to be separated from each other. So whatever it is, what we want to think about is, here's this initial population, right? Initial population. And this initial population represents the ancestor. And at some point in time, some sort of isolating mechanism created two different populations. But what we want to remember is that initially, initially they're the same species. Initially, same species, and they were the same population, right? Going back up to here, they were the same population, but something caused them to be isolated, all right? And so some examples of isolating mechanisms are outlined here below, and they can kind of be split into two groups, right? The first group, which we refer to as allopatric speciation, and the second group being sympatric speciation, okay? And so allopatric speciation comes from, uh, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe, I don't know if it's German, allo, okay? Meaning um, uh, other or different patrick being space, okay? And so uh, that is ultimately exactly what it is. Speciation as a result of a population being separated into a different space. So we think of this, the, the example would be geographic, geographical isolating mechanism geographical isolating. So a population is separated geographically. And I brought up a few of these examples on Friday's class. Um, many naturally occurring events on Earth's surface could lead to geographical isolation. So a population is separated geographically. We can think of forest fires, right? I think I talked of flooding, such things as earthquakes, volcanic eruption, right? Many, many different things could cause a species to be a population with it um, uh, to be separated and now that they represent two separate populations that don't interbreed they will evolve separately and so all of these if we go back to this right all of these various micro forms of microevolution, right? Going back to here. All of these forms of microevolution will occur very differently in each group, right? They're going to evolve separately. So whatever different forms of microevolution occur, eventually over millennia, right? Over millennia, the DNA will differ significantly. DNA differs significantly. I'm running out of space here, so we'll just say significantly, and you can finish that off, right? DNA differs significantly that they are unable to interbreed, right? So 
they can no longer interbreed and therefore they are separate species. Okay, um, now the other form is sympatric speciation. So this is a form of microevolution and it's a form of isolation, but it's a different form in the fact that it's not being in a different space. They're actually within the same space, but the gene pool changes due to different reasons, not due to geography or being separated by physical barriers, but something else. So this is speciation within the same location. So if we think of sim means same or similar, right? So gene pool, whoops, gene pool changes within the population within the same geographical location, within the same geographical location. Okay, so our first example of sympatric speciation is ecological. And so what we want to think of or make sure that we understand here is the, the individuals remain in the same um, area, remain in same area location, right? And so they're not separated by this location. They're not separated by this geological barrier, but by some other mechanism. So in the case of ecological, I want you to think of the term niche, okay? And so a niche is like the, the role of an organism in the, in the environment, role or, you know, activities, activities of an individual within its ecosystem. And so in the case of ec ecological speciation, or well, let's finish this, within its ecosystem. And so um, sometimes two individuals of the same species may start to, uh, their niche may start to change, right? So individuals, niche changes over time and this could be um, you know their feeding habits right um, and it could be their um, you know uh, predation Okay, our next example of uh, an isolating mechanism is temporal isolation. And so temporal isolation occurs uh, when um, the timing of significant reproductive events Right, the timing of significant reproductive events prevent members of the same population from breeding. This is most widely seen in plants. So if you think about spring and you think about when pollen is in the air, well, 
we all react to different pollen in different ways. And some of us might be impacted by those plants that are re reproducing early in the spring and the pollen that's out there. Um, I know uh, for me, the cottonwoods tend to wreak havoc, which doesn't typically start until later into June. Um, and so you've got plants evolving in different ways to avoid competition in, in terms of, um, of mating and reproducing, right? Now, again, of course, it's not plants choosing this, but the environment and nature selecting for variations in which uh, maybe uh, cones of certain trees developing or maybe flowers. So we think of all the different times in which plants flower, right? And that flower is the reproductive organ. And so, um, you know, and it might coincide, which we'll see actually down below with another example in terms of the evolution uh, or the changes of other organisms, thinking of insects and birds that many plants rely on for pollination, etc. So we've got a change in the timing, right? And it could even be just throughout the day behaviors um, uh, as well as seasonally over the course of the, the year. So behavioral isolation. Um, so uh, think of think of different animals that behave in different ways, right? So changes changes in behavioral changes in behavior lead to isolation. So think of things like you know frog calls, right? And the variation of frog calls, because slightly different frog calls might attract different mates. And so over time, you know, that ability to find a mate is dependent on your frog call or, you know, birds that perform all kinds of mating rituals, right? Uh, birds and, and mating dances. Just check it out online. There's all kinds of weird and quirky behaviors that organisms do in terms of finding mates. And so these can change. And as those change in individuals, now we've got behavior isolation that encourages those that respond to certain behaviors in certain ways will lead to uh, different uh, populations being isolated behaviorally, which will lead to speci speciation over time. The next one here is um, mechanical or chemical. So these could be reproductive um, so reproductive, many of these are all sort of fall under the category really of, of reproductive isolating mechanisms, right? I mean, that's ultimately reproductive isolating mechanisms, right? Whatever prevents individuals from uh, reproducing together leads to speciation, right? Reproductive isolating mechanisms. And so they could be mechanical or chemical. So reproduction, um, uh, isolation due to mechanical means. So for example, like uh, the structure of a flower, structure of a flower and its match for its pollinator, right? And so having a particular structure might prevent certain pollinators from um, transferring that pollen in a plant. Um, or we could think of, you know, even just uh, differences in the, in the makeup of our, our reproductive anatomy and how those changes might lead to differences that prevent the, the actual mechanics of transferring sperm to egg. And alternatively, chemical. So rather than it being a structural difference, but the, the production of certain chemicals, production of certain chemicals, which can represent barriers to gamete formation. 
and we talked about that earlier, gamete formation would be like the our reproductive cells, right? And how they form. Reproductive, sorry, cells. And their formation. So both of those mechanicals being the structure, shape, design of things, right? Whether it be flowers or other reproductive organs or chemicals, things that are produced within the individual um, that allow gamete formation or even the survival of the gamete or changes in the, in the gamete in such a way. So in lots of mammals, um, you know, the, the vaginal canal um, has a certain acidity, like a certain pH that uh, promotes the, the gametes and the survival of the gametes. And so sperm, you know, um, uh, traveling down the vaginal canal and fertilizing an egg, right? And that may vary from one individual to another. And so as those changes may occur over time, again, you've got an isolating mechanism that might prevent one individual from mating with another. Um, and the last example is what we call coevolution. And this is the process by which Uh, two separate species evolve together as each provides benefits for the other. Each provides benefits for the other, increasing chances of survival. And this could be a uh, most common example would be plants and flowers and the coevolution with the various insects and birds that um, that pollinate them, right? Um, and this is really great if you start to look at the structure of flowers and which uh, plant or insect or bird is pollinating. It's crazy, crazy um, uh, neat adaptations that have evolved over time because of the benefit each serves to the other. Other examples include uh, like fungal relationships with algae. So a fungus and an algae, totally different organisms. Uh, if you look at the uh, lichen, so an example, lichen um, is an organism which is actually both a fungus and an algae that coexist together and they've evolved together. And in fact, scientists have done research that if you remove one or the other from the actual lichen itself, that the other organism dies, right? That there's so much codependence in terms of, in the case of the fungus and the algae, the algae undergoes photosynthesis, which produces carbohydrates that the fungus can feed off, and the fungus grows in such a way that it provides a shelter and a habitat in which the algae grow. Uh, we'll look at some of those examples more coming up. That's the end. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you Monday. Uh, to finish off our last notes on taxonomy. All right, ciao.